Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning. A special welcome to all of you joining us online and to the, the clan that is here today for the Baron Baptism. It's a joy, it's a joy to have you with us here today for Brooks's Baptismal Day. So welcome. Thank you. A couple of announcements before we start with our worship service. Inside your bulletin, you'll find these. There are connect cards, there's contact information on the front, next steps of faith on the back. If you want to take a moment and fill that out, you can drop it into the offering basket on the way out the door there. And it's a way for you to connect with us and for us to connect with you. And also in the pews in front of you, you'll find these yellow prayer cards. If you have someone that you'd like us to pray for as part of our worship service today, please go ahead, fill that out now. And you can hand it to the ushers during the singing of this next song. And they'll bring it up to us so we can pray for your loved one as part of our worship service today. So a couple of announcements before we start with our worship service today. And the first is, it has to do with the season that we are in. As you can see, we are in a new season here. This is the season of Lent. And so that means that there's some things that change in the liturgy. And one of the things that changes is after communion, we'll sing a different post-communion canticle. Now, don't worry. It's the same one we did last year. You'll recognize it as soon as it starts. But just wanted to give you a heads up uh, that there is a different post-communion canticle. Also, something new I wanted to try is that as the baptismal family comes forward, one of my favorite songs is called Children of the Heavenly Father. And so we're going to bookend that baptism with, that, with the singing of that hymn. So just follow along. I want to give you a heads up. Speaking of new things coming down the pike here, summer registration is coming up for our camps. Now, I know it feels really crazy because like we just went through an Arctic winter here, right? But believe it or not, summer is indeed coming, and, uh, and those slots are already starting to fill up. And so if your child or your grandchild is interested, there's more information online, and you can also sign up there. Another opportunity we have is called Grief Share. This is a wonderful outreach into our community, a wonderful inreach here to our church, and we have two sessions that are meeting, Tuesdays in the daytime and Wednesdays in the evening, and for more information, I think there's uh, information in the bulletin. You can also contact the church office. And, you know, speaking of Wednesday nights, now that it's the season of Lent, uh, we will have uh, midweek worship services here in the sanctuary, 7 o'clock every Wednesday in Lent. And as we have in years past, once again, we will be using the Holden Evening Prayer. It's a beautiful, beautiful service. I'd encourage you to come and be a part of that. Make that part of your Lenten uh, devotion this season. So there's a bunch of things going on in our church. I encourage you to check them out at your convenience. But we've come to worship the Lord Jesus, and so let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you and we praise you for this day which you have given to us. Lord God, we thank you that after the last week, all that has happened to us, Lord, when we weren't able to gather as your children, that once again, Lord, this week we are able and so, God, we give you thanks. We give you praise. Lord, we thank you that the power is on. We thank you that the water is moving. We thank you, Jesus, that we are able to be here as your people. And Lord, come. Come and move among us in your Holy Spirit. Open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds to hear your word and to receive it. For we ask this, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. And our service begins with a brief order of confession and forgiveness, which is found on the screen above us. If you would please stand as you are willing and able. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, in these seconds of silence, let us confess our sins before the Lord.
Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share God's peace distantly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. <clears throat> In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. 
Let us pray. Gracious Father, your ears are open always to the prayers of your servants. Open our hearts and minds to you, that we may live in harmony with your will and receive the gifts of your Spirit. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the lesson. Our reading comes from the book of 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. But Elijah himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. And at the place he came to a cave and spent the night there. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Here ends the reading. I preach in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At the beginning of my internship time, Pastor Waters mentioned that there might be a possibility for me to lead the crafting of a sermon series. So since then, I've been carefully making a list of all of my ideas of things that might be interesting or good or exciting. And as it became time to choose from that now long list of items, I thought to myself, what is going to be not just good, but what is going to be something that brings our focus back on what is essential? And that's ultimately how I settled on the theme for our Sunday series in Lent, which is spiritual disciplines. Some of these might be disciplines that you've done yourself before, but the hope is that in bringing them all into one series, that is going to be very concrete and scripturally informed, there'll be ways to not just change one aspect of your life or to pick up an extra chore during Lent, but if you take spiritual disciplines seriously, they actually show you how to refocus your whole life. And on that topic of refocusing, it reminds me of about a month ago, I got some new glasses. And the prescription hadn't changed all that much from before. But what I noticed right away is that it makes a difference not to have all the old scratches and smudges on your glasses. I wasn't really consciously noticing all of those smudges and scratches on my old pair, but they were impeding my vision. The same thing happens in our lives too. 
our lives get loaded up with these scratches and smudges that we might dismiss and say, they're nothing, they're not really affecting our focus, my focus is on God. But then when we hit a roadblock, we might see that suddenly all of those sins and idols, those anxieties and temptations, they all start to run loose. We might think that our focus is set squarely on God, but really we may be focusing on everything that comes between him and us, all of those smudges and scratches. Spiritual disciplines, they don't make life perfect and they don't make life easy. They don't necessarily get rid of the roadblocks in life's way, but they do give us a new lens, a new order of priorities, a new set of life practices that can reorient our life to return ourselves to God so that he can do the work in us. And that's the key thing, that it's not about our work, Although spiritual disciplines are things that we commit to work through, that challenging effort and work, really it's not about our work at all, but about God's work in us. It's kind of the Christian paradox, that no matter how much we would like to save ourselves and help ourselves, really at the end of the day, we can't save ourselves, but have to rely on God to do that work for us. Spiritual disciplines then give everything back to God. Which brings us to the spiritual discipline topic for this week, which really takes the focus off of ourselves, giving up the very area of our thoughts and our beloved distraction with the spiritual discipline of silence. And by silence, I mean not only silencing the vocal words, but silencing the the distracting noises that we've been listening to, silencing our self-concerned narrative that we sometimes just let run on autopilot. Silence opens up our heart to offer our full attention to God. Now, the strange thing about silence is that it sounds deceptively easy. Really, that's all I have to do? Sit for a few minutes in silence? What's next? Bring me something more challenging. But if I had you all sit for just 15 minutes or one minute in complete silence and asked you to silence even the concerns of your thoughts, I think pretty soon, even if you could resist the temptation of chatting with your neighbor, we would all start to feel the urge to reach in our pocket and grab our cell phone or find a newsletter or a bulletin for some light reading. Silence, it turns out, is actually pretty challenging. It's pretty uncomfortable to do. It can feel like a waste of time, like we're just doing nothing. But the type of silence we're looking into, it's not nothing, it's not empty, but it's actually silence that has a purpose, to be a space set aside for God to enter. And we know that God does enter those types of silence. After all, ours is the God who created out of nothing by speaking his word into existence, bringing forth life. We read in scripture that people like Moses and David, Elijah and Paul and Christ and his disciples, they all did the spiritual practice of taking time for silence, to listen for God's voice to come and speak into their life. So we get the picture that God clearly uses silence, but why don't we commit to it? Why do we find it so challenging to do? I think it's because silence rubs against exactly how we would like to do life. It takes away all of our control and our ability to speak answers into our problems, which is maybe why many of us save it for the very last resort. In fact, in my experience, some of us will only turn to silence when we've reached the absolute end of the road and we are in a now what moment. You know that situation where even if you are an eternal optimist, you reach a certain point in time where you have taken every wrong turn. You have backtracked and tried to retrace your steps, but there's no more options for you to take except to put up your hands and say, now what? And it's sometimes in those moments where you are fully aware that there is nothing else you could say and do that sometimes we finally turn to silence. And in the scripture passage for today, Elijah is in one of those now what moments. 
His life has taken a complete 180. Just a while earlier, he had been the man of faith on top of Mount Carmel with all the power in the world, showing God's almighty power to those priests of Baal. But then everything turns. King Ahab and Jezebel aren't too happy with Elijah, so they tell him that he's going to be sentenced to death. Scripture says that Elijah goes into the wilderness. He leaves his servant behind. He finds a broom tree, and he prays to the Lord to take his life away. He's reached the now what moment. He has come to the end of being able to hold out any hope in himself. And I'm hoping we haven't had it quite that bad. But surely we can all resonate with that feeling of not knowing what comes next, where the only thing left is for that little voice inside to say, now what? And then wait for a response. And when given space to speak, here's what God does. He tells Elijah that truly the journey is too great for him to make alone. He gives him sustenance and then with all of creation at God's disposal, God comes not in a strong wind, not in breaking rocks or earthquake or fire, but scripture says that God enters in the sound of sheer silence. And from that point, God gives him direction, God gives him purpose, and he gives him his assurance that God is still present with Elijah as he was on that mountain before, as he's always been. God enters not in the way any of us would expect. We may not hear him in the chaos of the wind or the earthquake, not in those roadblocks or scratches in life and natural disasters we run into, but sure enough, our God will enter in the silence. We may still feel like we're in that wilderness with Elijah, hyper-focused upon all the spaces where we don't hear God speaking, focused on all the wind and all the earthquakes, all of the fire. But it is time to refocus our lives to God and return to his voice, to put up our hands and say, now what, Lord? In that great paradox of passivity, what we most need to do is admit that we need God. We need to turn to that silence because the truth is we are all in that humble space of being ultimately unable to save ourselves no matter how much we would like to. And I'd like to encourage you with my testimony about how recommitting to a discipline of silence has worked for me. It's hard to believe that now we've almost reached an entire year of experiencing this COVID situation. Thankfully, this Lenten season and this Easter will look very different than our last Lenten and Easter season. Amen, right? <laughs> but I still remember last Easter, and I'm sure many or all of you can relate to this too, of sitting there and wondering just how I could celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ in total social isolation going on a whole month of not speaking to a single other person face to face, staring at an online service of my home church's Easter service, not knowing how much uh, more suffering was happening in the world or when it would be over, a thousand miles away from home on the most important celebration of the year, not even able to take that sacrament of Holy Communion to know that God was present with me. Staring at that computer screen, I couldn't imagine that this was what Jesus had in mind when he said to go and share the good news. The news didn't feel good enough. It felt like the tomb was still empty. I knew God was alive, but where was he? Where had he gone? So I admit I turned immediately to fill that worry with noise. Searched out every Facebook Easter service I could find, read all the comment section, and then followed the rabbit trail. Followed every COVID article I could find, every news update, and the volume of worry just kept going up, notch after notch, getting louder and louder. Despite trying to put my focus back on God's presence, here I was committing to any source of noise that I could find, and not feeling any more reassured. I was sitting in that now what moment, knowing that what I was doing wasn't working. And in God's grace, 
not in an earthquake or a fire or a wind, but sitting there on my desk was a seminary assignment to ask me to write a reflection paper on God's great command from Scripture, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. There was no reflection paper getting written sitting at my computer. So I decided to go into a wilderness myself, a retreat, go on a hiking trail to get away. And again, almost immediately. Next slide, please. Almost immediately. I'm filling that silence with the voice of myself, of all of my worries, all of my anxieties. I'm trying to pick apart that Bible verse, pick apart the Hebrew, getting distracted by every tree branch and stream, every acorn in my way. And it wasn't doing any good. And then I realized maybe I should take that command seriously. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Maybe to hear and to listen, I would need to be silent. So I calmed my thoughts, and I asked God to speak. I said, tell me where you are present, Lord, here, because I don't know the answer, because I don't have the ability to know. It's out of my ability to find the answer myself. Coming to the end of the line, I was finally at that now what moment. And when I did this, there was no booming voice There wasn't a paper airplane launched at my head with a note from God. But with my focus finally off myself and my own searching and my own worrying, God could use that focus on him to show me what God was doing and saying there. And I think his voice did speak through all of creation. I began to hear that verse, hear, O Israel, as much as a command, as a promise to me that God would speak. The stream that I walked to, it reminded me of my baptism where God had claimed me and called me. The trees in the forest reminded me of the tree that Jesus hung on on the cross where he declared his love for us. And the empty acorns, the empty owl burrows, the nests without eggs and footprints without feet, every absence in the earth told me the story of the empty tomb, which points not to absence at all, but the presence of our risen Lord. The words and signs of God's voice and presence, they were all around me, creation proclaiming the gospel for any who would listen. What was required wasn't me having some great knowledge. It wasn't me having the answers, but a willingness to hear how God might respond. And I heard loud and clearly that God was surely still present with me and that these worries were not all mine to solve and carry. And since then, this opportunity to pause and hear that command, hear, O Israel, has encouraged me to stop and say, now what? More often not as a last resort, but as a continual refrain of my life to remember, I can't do it all on my own. So I need God's voice to speak, to comfort and direct me. And these opportunities of silence, they have become such firm places of encouragement, of direction and refocusing from myself back to God's will. We all have those now what moments, where we don't know what to do, where we're searching for God, searching for meaning, searching for the next step or direction, some reassurance. And it is too easy to turn our focus on all the smudges and scratches on our lens instead of turning our focus to the one person who can speak the words we need to hear. We are all in need of that still, calm voice of God somewhere in our lives. So make room for silence, not only when we hit that urgent now what disaster moment, but in the daily walking of life. We need God too, in the calm before the storm. It is good to prepare, it is good to listen. After we experience this crazy winter snowstorm, something that I keep hearing coming up is people saying, I wish I had been more prepared, or I wish our town or our state had been more prepared. I wish I had had water or stored up these groceries or known who to call for this or that. It turns out it makes quite a big difference to be prepared 
before that disaster hits. Preparing for the urgent makes a big difference in how we're able to weather the storm. Why not make room for God even now? Preparing our hearts in daily life before we reach those now what moments of disaster. And I would encourage you to use this space of Lent, a time to be set aside to start that preparation. You know, perhaps the most difficult but essential step to practicing silence is to take out the noise. For many of us, that constant noise has become almost an addiction. They say that our brain's response to cell phones and social media is sometimes in very similar ways to our brain's response to substances that are addictive, and I believe it. It's like we have this need to fill up silences with other noise, whether it's TV or news or media or every fad and news cycle, endless cycles of anxieties. But we can't hear anything else in our lives if our lives are always saturated with all the noises and pressures and constant volume of the world. So evaluate which voices God is using to speak his word into your life and which noises are drowning out the voice of God. Because if the noises are drowning out God's voice, then why are you listening to them? It is time to remove them or intentionally turn the volume down of their influence. And for those noises and areas of your life where we can't remove the worry, the worries that maybe we are actually called to hold and bear, we still need to have the humility to bring them to God in prayer and then allow God to speak into them. When you pray, don't let it be a one-sided conversation. But when you've poured out all of the noise and anxiety saying, these are all of my concerns, God, don't end it with an amen and move on with your day. But take a space of silence to hear how God may respond. God's will for us, especially in prayer, isn't that it's a one-sided phone call but he wants to respond and encourage you. Just as a parent might lovingly remind their child, dear, you would have known if you had only listened. And Lent is a very good period for listening, for learning to change our focus. When you take your daily quiet time, as I would encourage you all to do, to spend time daily in God's word, which he has given us, Take, don't just read through the scripture, breezing through it, and then check it off your to-do list. I love to-do lists, so I am guilty of that sometimes myself. I love to check it off and then move on with the next item. But after you've read that scripture, take the opportunity to ask the question, what is God telling me with this? As we bring God our concerns and fill our hearts with his word, don't miss that listening section. Don't neglect that pause as easy as it is to do. Because it's that very question which takes what you've read, what you've prayed, and turns the focus back from you and back to how God is there and present and speaking to you. I would even challenge you all to take one day during this Lenten season, to take a whole day or an afternoon of silence, a day of removing yourself from the noise where you put the listening into practice, just committing to reading scripture and praying and asking that question, what is God telling me apart from all the noises of the world? Practice taking off those old lens and returning your focus to God. And it will make listening to his voice so much easier when we encounter those periods of real trial if we have already practiced and are already familiar with how our Lord's voice sounds. So take that opportunity for silence now when times aren't so challenging or urgent. And when we listen for God, God will speak. We may have to wait through the earthquake and the fire and the wind, but as Hebrews 1 promises us, in the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets like Elijah in many and various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son who is the word made flesh. We have something far better than Elijah because we have something to hold up the voice of God to and discern whether it really is the voice of God. 
And as surely as Christ is in our midst, God's voice is there too. So this Lenten season, let us take stock of the wilderness we find ourselves in. And let us do the humble work of making a space of silence among all the noises of the world for God to speak. Let us humbly commit to turning our focus from ourselves to God and listen to his word which he longs for us to hear. For our God is present and our God is speaking and he longs for you to hear his voice. Amen. Inviting God now to speak into our lives, let us pray, beginning with a short moment of silence. Lord God, who speaks in the silence, receive and quiet the concerns of our hearts. Quiet the volume of worry that sometimes overwhelms us, and come, Lord Jesus, into our midst. Lord, teach us to pray anew by not only bringing you our worry, but then making space for your voice to enter. Lord, for each person here, each person listening now, I ask that your words would ring out clearly and that you would help us each set aside a time this Lenten season for silence, for seeking you. Amen. Thank you. And at this time, as I invite forward the family for the baptism, uh, together we are going to sing the first two verses of Children of the Heavenly Father while the family comes up for baptism. So this is Brooks Barron, and he was born in December, right? So a little over two months old, so welcome. So today what is happening in baptism is God is claiming this boy for himself. Just as this candle, right, this candle cannot light itself. No matter how much we preach to it, no matter how much we teach it, I, this candle cannot light itself, but has to be lit from above. So too none of us can by our own strength or power come to the Lord Jesus Christ or believe in him. But it's only by God's work, God gives us his Holy Spirit through baptism and the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. The Holy Spirit creates faith where there, where there was none before. And that's what's going on today. Now he's too young for this, so. Oh, there you are, yeah, there you are. You got it? Okay. Let us begin. In holy baptism, our gracious and heavenly Father liberates us from sin and from death by joining us to the death and the resurrection of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We are all of us born the children of a fallen humanity, but in the waters of baptism, by the power of God, we are reborn as the children of God and as the inheritors of eternal life. And as we live with God and with his people, we learn to grow in faith, in hope, in love, in obedience to his will until that day when Jesus Christ comes again. And so I ask, who is it who brings this child forward for baptism today? Wonderful. And so you should, therefore, faithfully bring him to the services of God's house. You should teach him the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Ten Commandments. As he grows up in years, you should place into his hands the Holy Scriptures and provide for his instruction in the Christian faith, so that living within the covenant of this, his baptism, and in communion with the church, your son can lead a godly life until the day that Jesus Christ comes again. 
Now, these are the obligations which you take upon yourself as the sponsors and as the parents. Do you promise to fulfill them? If so, please say, I do. Let us pray. O holy God, mighty Lord, and gracious Father, we give you thanks. For in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters and you created the heavens and the earth. And by the gift of water you nourish and sustain us and all living things. By the waters of the flood you condemned the wicked and saved those whom you had chosen, Noah and his family. You led Israel by the pillar of cloud and fire through the sea, out of slavery and into the freedom of the promised land. In the waters of the river Jordan your son was baptized by John and anointed by the Holy Spirit. And by the baptism of his own death and resurrection, your beloved Son has set us free from the bondage to sin and death and has opened a way to joy and freedom and life. And Jesus made water to be a sign of the kingdom and of cleansing and of rebirth. And therefore, in obedience to his command, we make disciples of all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, pour down your Holy Spirit upon brooks, that he who is baptized here today may be given new life. Father, wash away all of his sins as he is cleansed with this water and bring him forth as an inheritor of your glorious kingdom. For to you be given praise and worship through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so I ask you then to profess your faith in Christ to Jesus, to reject sin, and to confess the faith of the church, the faith into which Brooks will be baptized. So I ask you, do you renounce all the forces of evil, the devil and his empty promises? Do you believe in God the Father? And together we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. And you believe in God, the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, Brooks. Brooks. Oh, sorry, buddy. Brooks Drew Berend, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There you go. All right, if you can hold them up for us, please. O oh God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for freeing your Son from the power of sin and for raising him up to new life through this holy sacrament. Lord, pour down upon brooks and through your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and the spirit of joy in your presence. Amen. Brooks and Drew Barron, Son of God, you have been sealed. Oh, over here, buddy. <laughs> there you go. You have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have been marked with the cross of Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, the giver of all life, look with kindness upon the father and mother of this child, Cameron and Caitlin. Lord, let them ever rejoice in this gift whom you have given to them and make them to be teachers and examples of righteousness for their son. Lord, strengthen them in their own baptism so that they can share with Brooks the, the, the eternal life that you have given them through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
And through baptism, God has made Brooks a member of the priesthood which we all share in Christ Jesus, that we can proclaim the praise of God and bear his creative and redeeming work into all the world. And together we welcome him, saying, we welcome you into the Lord's family. We receive you as a member of the body of Christ, a child of the same heavenly Father, and a worker with us in the kingdom of God. May I? Yep. All right. Hi, buddy. Oh, my goodness gracious. <gasps> Let's welcome the newest member of our church and of God's kingdom, Brooks Drew Barron. <laughs> Amen. If you would please stand for the reading of the sing. Congratulations. He's adorable. Congratulations. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty Lord, Heavenly Father, we praise you and we worship your holy name. We pray, Lord, that during this Lenten season which we have begun, you would help us to refocus our lives on you. Through your word, you remind us, Lord, to be still and know that you are God. Help us grow in the discipline of silence before you help us listen to you, grant us the will to remove our daily distractions and obstacles in our lives and keep our focus on you. May we listen to your voice. By your Holy Spirit, Lord, change our hearts and our minds to conform to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy. God of grace and mercy, we pray for all who have been impacted by the cold weather in our community and in the communities around us in Texas. We pray for those who suffered great hardships and especially for those who continue to be without power or water or suffer food shortages. We pray for quick relief and assistance Teach us, Lord, not to take for granted the daily gifts that you provide for us and to acknowledge the benefits you give even in adversity. Lord, in your mercy. But we pray for our church, for our ministries. We rejoice with those who rejoice and especially we give thanks for the baptism of Brooks Drew Barrent as you claim him your, his own. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, we bring to you the problems of this world. We pray for our nation. We pray for all who govern, that you would guide them with wisdom and discernment. We pray for our troops deployed around the world, that you would protect them from harm, sustain their families during this time of separation. We pray, Lord, for sufficient supplies of the vaccine for COVID-19 and more efficient distribution system. We entrust to your care, especially the elderly, in nursing facilities and homebound, that they may be able to receive the vaccine as first priority. Show your mercy and compassion to all who are in need. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Gracious Lord, we pray for those who are ill, especially for those who ask that we pray for them. We pray for Debbie Holman as she is hospitalized for viral pneumonia. We pray for Lindsay, Barb, Tiffany, and Karen who are fighting breast cancer, for Fred fighting liver failure. We pray for Robin Weiss and Carol Wigginton, for Fuchsia Reed and Jennifer Jones. We continue to pray for Shirley Steidel and Sky Baldwin, Chell Oliverson, Betty Steubing, 
Sue Bartman, Grant Meadows, Roland Funky, for Judy Kunz, Judy Catalan, Eric Franz, Lanell Day, Anna Miltenberger, and Seanette Gom. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting not in ourselves, but in your great mercy toward us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And please be seated, as at this time our service continues with a special musical offer. Stand now as we begin our communion liturgy. We Lutherans believe, teach, and practice that communion is what our Lord Jesus tells us it is. It is his own body and blood given to us in, with, and under the bread and wine given to us freely for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of eternal life. Therefore, all who believe in Jesus, all who have been baptized into Christ, are welcome to receive his body and blood. Communion, uh, it will be by trace. You'll find at the center, very center, grape juice. Also, we have gluten-free elements available upon request. 
Please cup your hands and also follow social distance. We continue with the letter G. The Lord be with you. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. You bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Renew our zeal in faith and life and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Communion assistants, please come forward. blood of Christ shed for you.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Amen. Communion prayer is printed above us. We pray it together. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is In the Cross of Christ I Glory. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.